want to do meaningful work. Likewise, serving Christ does not mean not serving my boss. You do not get any special exemption from this command to obey those who are in legitimate authority over you at work just because you're a Christian and you're also submitting to Christ. What you need to see is that just as wives submitting to their husbands is fitting in the Lord, children submitting to their parents is pleasing to the Lord, bond servants, employees, whatever else, submitting to those who are in authority legitimately over them at work is an act of submission to Christ himself. If Christ is your master, you will obey those who are your masters in the flesh. Your earthly masters, as it's translated here. Now, it doesn't mean you have to exhibit blind submission at work without any initiative or intelligence or opinion on things. But it does mean that in a way that probably your non-Christian co-workers will not be able to appreciate or understand, you will delight and have a positive attitude in doing what's required of you. You will be obedient. You will not be grumbling or complaining about your boss. You will not be always suspecting them of power grabs. You will not be uh, generating a sense of entitlement. Well, I never had to do that before. He doesn't pay me enough to do that kind of work. That attitude of complaining about authority is the opposite of what it looks like for you to work in truly meaningful ways by serving the Lord at work. <coughs> Second thing is that you need to work sincerely. You see this again in verse 22. You don't obey your masters by way of eye service. That's very straightforwardly what the Greek word says here, eye service. As if you're kind of working and you're kind of waiting for your vice president to kind of walk around the corner and suddenly you'll start typing, right? And then you'll walk around the corner over there and you'll get your body out again, right? You've seen it. You've done it. It's a natural thing to sit. No. We don't work so that people will see us and notice us and affirm us. We work because the Lord sees us all the time. And we have a sincere desire to please Him, which means that in everything we do, we want to do it in a way that will please the Lord. Remember a story that was I heard once from a sermon on a text like this. It was a, a girl who had become a Christian. And someone asked her how she knew she was a Christian. And she said, well... I used to only clean the places people could see at the restaurant where she worked. But now she cleans even behind the chairs and the windowsills and all of that. Right? Because work, good work, is valuable as a service and offering to the Lord. Not just because it gets you the affirmation and approval of others. Sincerity here is described as fearing the Lord. There is a phrase you don't hear much in the workplace, if you breathe. That's the basic Old Testament word for being a godly person, fearing the Lord, counting the Lord's opinion of you as the most important thing in your life, infinitely more important than your boss's opinion of you. Fearing his disapproval, desiring his approval. Uh, this is, by the way, a great proof text for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, because who is the Lord and Master in this text? Uh, we talk about fitting in the Lord, pleasing to the Lord, fearing the Lord. Who is the Lord? You received Him in chapter 2, verse 6, and He's described all the way through chapter 1. Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn King of creation, King of the church. He's the Lord we are to fear. It's a great proof text, actually. For the deity of the Lord, that's such an Old Testament idea, you would fear Yahweh. But now in the New Testament, we can also say that we fear the Lord Jesus. And that shows how important your work is to your Christian life. I mean, if you can go to work, and that can be a God-fearing thing to do. It shows you. What you do between 9 and 5, or whatever your work hours are, are not some little appendix to your walk with the Lord. They are a crucial part your Christian discipleship in your Christian life. A third thing, we must work diligently. Whatever you do, work as much as you like. Work your own hours. Work a flexible schedule. Right? These are the, the terms that we talk about when we talk about meaningful work these days. It doesn't say that. It says work heartily. Work hard. Be diligent. 
This is again something that describes everybody in the Christian church and the Christian life. Whatever your employment situation is, young, old, whatever your situation is, Christians are people who work hard. Again, that gets back to the fact that God is a God who works hard. And laziness is a sin that displeases the Lord to no end. You think through the book of Proverbs, who's, what's one of the main figures in the book of Proverbs that's constantly, constantly warned about is the lazy man, the idle man. There's that amazing description of it. As a hinge turns, as a door turns on its hinge, so the lazy man turns in his bed. Right? There's some movement. He's alive, but he never makes it. You know, a door never gets farther from the hinge because it's moving, right? And the lazy man never gets farther from his bed because he's moving. He just sits around and does nothing. Folks, that displeases the Lord. It displeases the Lord to see a lazy child. It displeases the Lord to see a lazy retiree. So next time you read the marketing about some awesome retirement in Florida where you can golf all day every day for the rest of your life, just remember, the Lord loves hard work in every situation of life. I've made some comments the last number of months about this and it will work on the list. Maybe in this area, that's the same we need to talk about a lot. But discussions with lots of people have alerted me to the fact that there's also a side to this. We need to talk about that when we go to work hard at the office, my talk about workaholism, I hope, hasn't made, feel anyone, made anyone feel that they shouldn't be working hard. Right? Put in the hours. Get up early. Go to bed late. Study hard. Take a full course load. Go for the next project. Sink yourself into meaningful, valuable work. Because the Lord is not displeased with you for excelling and pursuing and engaging your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul in hard, gratifying, productive, valuable work. That is good. And that's a balance that we need to strike. We need to work diligently. Uh, you may know the fourth commandment is the commandment about Sabbath rest. But there's two sides to that commandment, isn't there? One day out of seven, you're to rest and keep it holy to the Lord. And six days you shall work and do all your labor. So it's just as much of a breach of that commandment to not rest on a Sabbath day as it is to not work the other six. Wouldn't you agree? And let me say, if you're trying to strike the balance between working too much, working too little, observing a Sabbath is going to be a crucial part of your success. Some of you have jobs where you're not able to, for a legitimate reason. And the scriptures make room for that as a legitimate uh, possibility. But if you're a student, or an employee, or whatever, and work is going to take over your life, the thing to do is guard your Sabbath day. Come to church. I guarantee you, I absolutely 100% guarantee you that you are not too busy to take a Sabbath day. You are not too busy to honor the Lord with your time. You just aren't. God will see to it that you are not too busy. And I can't tell you how many different times I've seen it in my own life and in the lives of others that the very busiest times of my life were also the times of my life but the Sabbath was the most delightful thing, the easiest and most blessed experience of my week, and wasn't an interference at all. It's people often who aren't engaged so much in work and aren't as busy that have the hardest time appreciating the Sabbath. Right? Maybe you've experienced that too. And if you're if you if you've not been keeping a Sabbath day. I think the thing to do, rather than assume that you're too busy to start, is to repent of your faithlessness in the Lord and say, Lord, I will honor you in my work and in my rest every day of the week, and I'll trust that you are able to see to the details. You need to do that. And I hope that Sabbath day after Sabbath day, here in the Lord's house, you are getting the rest you need from your daily, weekly work. So that you are fitted to go back and serve the Lord again Monday to Saturday. Okay? So the <laughs>
Sabbath is going to be a crucial part of this. A fourth comment. We need also to work hopefully. Notice what the Lord says in verse 24. We work heartily knowing that from the Lord we will receive the inheritance as your reward. Some of you, probably even just this week, the only thing that got you to Friday afternoon was the reality of a paycheck. Do you agree? There's been days like that for me, for sure. Days like that for you. There's almost nothing you enjoy about work except the fact that afterwards you can eat, which is good. It's not bad, by the way, to be motivated by desire for money. Okay? Scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil, but that's not the same thing as desiring um, prosperity and security and stability financially. So it's okay if all the motivation you can summon this week is that you need a paycheck. That's good. You need to provide for your family and for yourself and contribute to the church. But I want to point you to the best salary that any employer can offer. The inheritance. The inheritance. What's, what's Paul talking about here? If you sign up to work for the Lord Christ, the true master, Jesus Christ, he will reward you not with just a few dollars a week, but with what Colossians 1 verse 12 describes as the inheritance of the saints in life. Heaven is your reward. Eternal life is your paycheck. The blessing of living with God and all the splendor of heaven is the glory and the reward that comes after the difficulty of the busyness and the work of the Christian life. It doesn't mean that you earn the blessing of heaven because you can't earn an inheritance, right? You cannot do that. It's legally impossible to earn an inheritance. Someone can just say, I, I leave this land to so-and-so, but there's no legal arrangement for earning an inheritance. Same in Scripture. These slaves would have had no possibility, by the way, of ever inheriting land because they weren't sons in the family. But by this comment, Paul shows them that they are sons of God's family and that their work in this life will be richly rewarded, not because they deserve it, but because we have a good Father in heaven who leaves to his sons an inheritance that is far beyond anything that we could earn for ourselves. The inheritance. And so, as you go to work, nine to five, again, whatever other schedule you may have, remember that day by day, you are laying up not only a paycheck at the end of the week, but treasure in heaven. And the inheritance that Jesus has won for you comes to you through your good works for the Lord. It is by your life of good works, most of which will happen at your place of employment, because that's where you spend most of your time. That's how you will walk the road to the day that you will finally enter into the inheritance that Christ has made for you. I want to leave you with one comment. I've been reading a book about, uh, about work and business recently. It's not a Christian book, but I found a comment that I sort of anecdote that I thought would be a good way to close this morning. Uh, this author was working in a branch of a coffee shop in Manhattan, and he met an employee there who had been working there for six years. Uh, quite a remarkable thing, because this chain and that type of work, you don't usually have a long tenure. He says, I met David while having coffee with a friend. The first thing I noticed was that he walked over to a line of tourists and cheerfully said, hey guys, we have another bathroom upstairs, no need to wait. With a smile, he moved away, energetically cleaning off tables and straightening things that didn't seem particularly crooked to me. If this was menial labor, no one told David. As the hour wore on, I saw him greet people, help without asking, offer to watch a table or get something for someone. In a coffee shop, of all places. I asked him about his attitude. He smiled, stopped for a second and told me, I work for blessings. Let's pray. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you that you are Lord, not only of our life on Sundays, but of our life throughout our week. We thank you that you have provided everything we need to live for you and work and labor for you wherever you have placed us. And we pray that diligent, obedient, sincere, and hopeful work will be in this world a great testimony so that many will come to see the loveliness of Christ and the beauty of serving Him and enjoy.
enjoying hope in his coming salvation.